go. Nice and easy. No way out, little guys. Not out of this gem. There's a cylinder on the ground in which the man is arranging some netting. It looks like some kind of trap. He notices you. Who's there? Oh, the police. Hello, officers. His self-conscious enthusiasm renders his movements ungainly. He looks like your understanding of a scientist. Is that the police? Why are the police here? Don't worry, Gary. I'll handle it. To what do I owe the pleasure? That's sarcasm. He takes no pleasure from your appearance. Oh no, it's all right. I'm just busy. What's this about? Hey, of course. Thank you for passing along the message. That damn water lock is broken, and we can't go all the way around the 881. The 881 is a raised motorway that separates Martinez from Jamra. The labyrinth of streets underneath it makes it difficult to pass. Not like walking over a nice water lock. Ah, oh, good. We should really be getting back. Gary could use a hot shower and a warm bid. Did he say we can go back now? Yes, Gary! We can go soon! If you see Lena, tell her I won't be long. Sir, your wife is waiting for you. I just have to do one more round. See if the phasmid has taken the bait. Then we're going. Hmm. Well, first of all, it's damn difficult to find, which is why we've been knee-deep in the reeds laying traps for it. Typical rookie assumption. Insects are much more sophisticated creatures than those unversed in zoology give them credit for. Even simply catching a glimpse of the Insulindian phasmid would be the apex of my, of any, cryptozoology's career. But to study it and its defences, find out how it stayed hidden so long. I'm expecting it to be quite giant. One known species of phasmid, called the Megaphasmodea zoensis, is about the size of a grown man's forearm. So, uh... Good question. Being a phasmid of the order Phantasmodea, a ghost insect, it disguises itself as plant matter. In this case, the reeds. Awful lot of reeds around, aren't there? And I suspect it may have also developed other specialised techniques to protect itself from predators or scientists in our present case. It's my hypothesis that it has evolved certain electrochemical defences that allow it to interfere with animal perception, impeding pattern recognition, confusing the visual cortex. But I cannot describe how these defences work, much less how they evolve, without studying a live specimen. Yes, it makes perfect sense. You're beginning to suspect there's something paranatural about this phasmid. A ghost insect, he said. These people are looking for a ghost. No, that is precisely what we're not. We are zoological specialists looking for an extant species of phasmid. Very little, I'm sorry to say. No one's ever captured a specimen, so all our information is based on first and third hand accounts. Not yet. That's what makes it a cryptid. Um, <clears throat> just out of curiosity, if there's no proof of its existence, how do you know it's real? 
I know it's real. It's clear that his obsession with the Phasmid is driven by something more than the pure pursuit of scientific advancement. By which I mean, I've heard enough first-hand accounts to believe quite firmly that the Insulindian Phasmid is more than mere superstition. Yes, the most recent sighting was by a couple of teenagers along the coast here. That's what brought us to Martin Hayes specifically. It's the first credible sighting in several decades. Admittedly, it's an unusual location for this species, but with all the sewage runoff upstream, it probably doesn't matter much anymore. I have to resist the thought. Such an extraordinary creature is doubtlessly highly resilient. After all, it's generally thought to be capable of parthenogenesis. He means asexual reproduction. The females of the species don't need to mate to produce viable eggs. This makes it easier for a species with a small population to survive. Yes, the Insulindian phasmid is a very clever insect. That's why it's so damn difficult to catch. But as a scientist, I'll try my best to remain dispassionate. Well... They may not look impressive, but Lena designed them quite cleverly, so I'm sure they'll do the trick. Yes. Simple. Attracted by the locusts, the phasmid crawls down the funnel and, having eaten its fill, can get back out. At least, that's the intention. The net isn't a perfect solution. But we didn't want to use anything that might damage the specimen's delicate exoskeleton. Locusts. Nearly all known phasmids are herbivores, of course. But we've hypothesized that the Insulindian phasmid might occasionally prey on other insects. Inside the traps, a number of locusts crawl and tumble over one another in a tiny, chittering swarm. A meat-eating stick insect? Does it pretend to be the reeds as part of its ambush behavior? This seems unlikely. Thank you for your opinion. We have also included plant material in the traps to satiate your skepticism. They'll work, I assure you. The predatory hypothesis, using locusts as bait, accounts for the failure of previous efforts by other teams, which use plants. We have given this some thought. The traps do seem to be deftly and thoughtfully constructed. It's clear the cryptozoologist's wife knows what she's doing. Yes. What? And I'm eager to return to her, I assure you. But I can't leave before we finish with these traps. My wife understands that just as well as anyone. Come on, Morel. We've been soaking out here for days. It's time to go back. And leave the traps? Absolutely not. I won't let Lena down. Come on. She wants us back. I'm soaked up to my nuts over here. We'll both catch reed crabs if we don't dry out soon. I'm doing this for science, and so is she. Of course it's important to her. She's seen it. A verified sighting, on record. One of only four this century, and it's hers. She's seen it? Yes, that's how we first came to know one another, in fact. But that's her story to tell, not mine. <laughs> Needless to say, you must ask her about the mysterious phasmid. Suffice to say, it's long been our dream to find proof of the Insulindian phasmid together. I 
can't abandon course now. No, no, no. The traps need to be monitored on a regular schedule. What would we do if the Fairsmid were to starve while we were sipping tea at the hostel? He's dead set on this. Hmm. I could go for some trap setting. I didn't expect you to take such an interest in our work here, officer. Yes, indeed. Both require a great deal of research, attention to detail, and, above all, persistence. There are four in total. One is to the south, on this little peninsula. By the boathouses there. It's very near. Another we set in Land's End, to the northeast. It's behind a small sand dune there, on your way to the old radio tower, after the church. The third is set near the canal, where you crossed, by a concrete slab. A big thicket of reeds going up the slope, and among them... You should check at least one of those before returning to this one, since I just said it. This one's more of a technicality, but still, better safe and stupid than sorry. That seems like a lot. Do we really have time for this extracurricular venture? Is it? Bring it to me at once. Just make sure the trap is closed tight. He's not comfortable with the possibility that you'll claim the find, but he's lying about this even to himself. That's highly unlikely, officer. But in the event you do, I'll spray you with a pheromone mixture I developed. It's made of musk and research chemicals. The pheromone should attract the insect to you, or at least prevent it from bolting at the sight of you. It's quite potent. Will last you about a week. I hope you're not paying this. He dispenses it without letting you touch the canister, so it would be precious like holy water. It is precious. A single dose cost me 50 real to develop. Not that I expect you to understand self-financing one's own research. Right. Which means you two can pack up and go back to the whirling. Finally! Someone's talking sense. Thank you for your help. Gary and I will start breaking down camp. If you have any more questions, now's the time to ask. We'll be gone once you get to it. If it's more cryptid-related business you want to discuss, you'll have time for that later, too. But what if the information is vital on the hunt? What about his eager-to-leave friend Gary there? Talk to him, too, perhaps. I've just always liked animals and puzzles. Searching for cryptids is a bit of both. It's not child's play, just because I have to trape through the mud every so often. Real. I know you think one is a respectable profession, while the other is superstition. Everyone does. Indeed. My methods do not differ from other scientists. I simply draw upon a wider variety of evidence. And I... No, as I said, I have yet to catch a cryptid. Although I have come close. Close enough to keep trying. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Something for later, this close call. Everything from forgotten regional law to newspaper accounts, like the one that brought us here. To look for the Fairsmith, 
I keep a very open mind. He's interested in things that people believe that scientists don't. Most establishment scientists only care about reputation and remuneration. Not real research. And certainly not the truth. They're a cowardly lot. And both the field and basement archives can be dangerous places. No. Very few cryptids are ever discovered. And not for a lack of trying. To stay hidden is a cryptid's primary quality. It's even in the name, cryptid. Of the list of cryptids kept by the Cryptozoological Society of Shemni, which is 4,082 items long, about 2,000 have been confirmed as hoaxes. Two are categorised as confirmed discoveries. The rest are in differing stages of discovery, refutation, and data collection. Yes, the Chateau Quan Forest Pygmy, who turned out to be an extinct species of primate, and a cave salamander from Hugo Grad, who is, honestly, quite unremarkable. It's in a zoo somewhere. We cryptozoologists are brutally honest with ourselves, more so even than the public. With cryptids, most cryptids are hoaxes or they are never found. That does not mean we should stop searching. Indeed. If our expedition is successful, every paper in the world will report on it. From Revachol to Dushan too. It will be a zoological miracle. He has clearly done his math on this. There is no surprising him or swaying his opinion. Yes? All right. What cryptids precisely? I usually discuss these things with specialists, so I don't know what. We would have to discuss, he wants to say, but decides against it, since you've offered to help. I see you've been talking about cryptids with Lena. The kind green ape is one of her favourites. We travelled to South Safra to look for it once. Gary and I got stuck in a rainstorm though. And had to spend most of our time there in a little village. The search was fabulously unsuccessful. But the people were very nice. I'm glad they didn't understand what Gary was saying about them. What? South Safra? They're just on a different rung of the ladder, Morel. I had no problem with them. Really? You kept complaining about how dirty everything is, but we digress. They're a nascent culture. I just didn't feel comfortable. And let's change the topic, okay? Talk about your critters, or whatever. A willow person. It's a long story. One non-specialists would find rather dull. Willow people? Not at all. They're not people, really. Some argue they aren't really animals. As they seem to have evolved directly from trees. They're very, very thin. Almost flat, in fact and can camouflage themselves easily, wrapping themselves around trees and blending in with the tree bark. In that way, they're not too dissimilar from the phasmid we're looking for here. You probably have. Gary and I painted an entire grove's worth of trees in slow drying paint. It was a bright lavender colour. I was hoping one of the willow people would get paint on it and not be able to camouflage itself. After waiting in hiding for hours, I saw a figure slip from one of the trees, a lavender shadow dashing through the grove. I chased it with a knit, not very elegant, 
you can't be elegant in the field. And, well, it was faster than me. A lavender shadow. I know you think we were snacking on fanny mushrooms. It's easier to mock someone than to admit that the world might be more interesting than you've imagined. Furthermore, I am not saying it was a confirmed sighting. I'm painfully aware of what goes into verifying such things. There is a serious possibility that I saw a squirrel or a trick of the light. I am my own harshest critic. He makes it a real point here to sound falsifiable. Confirmed. It's 100% verified and meets all the standards of an authentic cryptid sighting. No offense, officer, but I'm not much of a pedagogue. I don't know what I would have done if Lena hadn't persuaded me to go back to field research. You should ask her if you want interesting stories. Me? I'm not a people person, unless you haven't noticed. And I don't make a good lecturer. My strength lies in field work and persistence. By all means. <laughs> Wompty Dompty Dom Center. You're at home, stupid cop. Not with the art crowd. You hate them. Everyone hates them. Even they hate themselves. It's nauseating. An industry built on sprezzatura and sparkling wine. And, let's be honest, tax evasion schemes. The Wompty Dompty Dom Center is the heart of this unholy symbiosis of aesthetics and tax optimization. And now that you've internalized it, you can have a piece too. I'm Gary. Very generous of you to help us out, officer. Yellow man! I mean, officer. The lieutenant raises his eyebrows slightly and takes out his notebook. Yellow man? Interesting. This is something to ask him about, after a little probing first. I'm just waiting for my friend Morel to finish up with his insect traps so we can return to civilization. I like nature, just not this bloody coast. It's mostly drunks and degenerates that come here. Degenerates? This man respects authority too much. To see the truth inscribed upon thine own visage. Pretend thou art a paragon of virtue. Dark times will do that to good men. My mug? W why would you think that? His eyes widen at the sight of the mug. He's seen it before, all right. Really? I hear it all the time. 
All in jest, of course. No offense meant to anyone. Okay, okay, I admit it. I threw the mug away in the trash container behind the hostel. I know I shouldn't have, and I am very sorry, officer. You're not going to find me, are you? Whew. Thank you. You won't regret this. I won't use another man's property to dump my garbage ever again. I don't know what got into me, really. Work has been stressful lately. Damn Koiko's price dumping us out of competition. What did you do, Gary? Nothing. Nothing. Just answering some questions. Helping out the law. I know a guy who works with the trash collection services, CS Municipal. He gave me a master key for the trash containers of Martinez. So I can use the Whirling's trash compactor to store my own stuff. Garbage disposal is expensive as hell. The damn Bohemians run it like a mob. I'm sorry, okay? I thought I could cut costs. I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have disgraced myself. Disgraced? No need for the histrionic, sir. It was, after all, just a trash container. He studies his reaction. Gary doesn't answer. Officer, please. Let me explain. It's not like that. I was only cleaning up. I live right across the yard from where he was hanged, and I saw him stripped naked. All the clothes lying around in the yard, smelling. People are animals, you know? Then I came out to clean up the rags, because no one else would. I put them into the Whirling's trash, along with a broken mug, admittedly. Okay. I was coming to throw the mug away, and, well, I threw the mug there and the clothes too. Right. It was just civic duty. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. Civic duty. Armor? No. I, I mean, yes. Of course. I know he was wearing armor, but I don't know anything about it. An infant could see he's not telling the truth, but he's too scared to admit more wrongdoing. There's something going on here. You should observe it more closely after this topic is concluded. I hope I can help your investigation, in my small way. No, no. I help Morel with research sometimes, and I've learned some things along the way. But I don't usually go in for picnics like this on my own. After all this time with Morel, he must have an opinion on cryptids. This could lead to a good one. Oh, yes. The burning rhino. Morel doubts he's real, but I don't much care because I won't be the one looking for him out in Safra Serai. A rhinoceros that looks ordinary during the day, but burns brightly by night. Well, at least the males do. They have special ducts just above their shoulder blades that secrete a combustible fluid. When the rhino is just beginning to light itself, it looks as though it has wings of fire. But how is this combustible fluid lit? The rhino starts running very fast to build heat, then stops, raises its head, and sparks fly from its neck, setting its back ablaze. We don't really do that around here. 
Perhaps we should have more such decisive action in Rivercon. You know, this city used to be a flaming rhino once. A long time ago. The flames are not just for decoration. They are an integral part of the beast's mating behavior. During the burning rhino's mating season, herds of male rhinos, all aflame, encircle herds of female rhinos, forming a fiery ring as they begin to copulate loudly. Local peasants call it the passion ring. They fear the rhinos, as perhaps they should. Anyway. The lieutenant sighs without looking up from his notes. Not many Seolites here, or anywhere, other than Sale. I meant no offense, truly. Oh, yes, of course he is. I was just speaking about his... connections. Let's change the subject, okay? Sounds like some conspiracy topic. You might be able to discuss it with him when the lieutenant isn't here, if you can remember it. Guillaume Le Million. Bad news. Guillaume Le Million did not become a cop. In 38, he went on a tour to the Xinyao province in Safre, where he died of autoerotic asphyxiation. His body was found hanging from a decorative dragon tree in his junior suite amid drug paraphernalia, unwholesome objects, and the Sylvia Trainer single. Wonderland skipping in the background. And yes, you can take this as a metaphor for Revachol in the 30s. And also as a warning. Always a pleasure, I mean, officers. I told you everything I know, sir. I'm truly sorry for the mug, but I have nothing to do with that. He's not feeling too comfortable in his own skin. Odd, I'd say. Uncomfortable shifting around doesn't make him the killer, though. It's something else. Is he? He's looking comfortable enough. Maybe it was just beads. Sounded like beads. But what kind of beads might a man like Gary be hiding beneath his clothes? I don't pray, officer. Faith in non-existent helpers is a sign of weakness. Not for proper Revacolian men such as ourselves. That patch of reeds over there, it's a great place to hide something. Kind of out of the way, being so close to the water. You don't have a reason to. Yet. Nothing. Just a hunch. The hunch passes, leaving you there, by the old boy bobbing in the water. Time to go.
There's a trap in the reeds at your feet. Looks like the same one you saw Morel set before. Same mesh, same wiring. The reeds bend forlornly toward the sand. You see slabs of concrete north. In the east, the city center hums to you. The constant distant song, louder on this part of the coast, nearer somehow. And there's that cold again, always the cold. Locusts are crawling around in the trap, confused but uneaten. You see no carnivorous reed phasmid gorging on them. Big surprise. Anyway, one down, three to go. Surely. Anyway, the air is nice and fresh here. familiar apparatus lies among the reeds, another one of Morel's traps, weighed down by stones to keep it in place. Behind you, the ruins of a residential building rise over the reeds, shielding them from the wind. The reeds rustle confidently. This trap is also full of panicked locusts, no sign of any cryptozoological beast inside. Another empty trap. Always up for a good job. Otherwise, would I still be on this case with you? This is the trap Morel just set. Checking it over, he said, is just a technicality. But... Someone has left an unidentifiable article of clothing on this railing. It smells really bad. It's streaked with dried seagull shit and tangled with pieces of seaweed. A dangling arm suggests that there might be a jacket beneath the crust of filth. It seems likely that it was left in the surf until someone laid it out on this fence to dry out. Unfortunately, that just seems to have stiffened it into a shapeless mass. Please tell me you're not taking that with you. A clue? 
You think our suspect is a seagull who's been defecating on unsuspecting jackets? <sighs> a poet could write a dozen verses and still not begin to capture the profound vexation in that sigh. You should still take it. As you hold it in your hands, it makes an uncomfortable crunching sound. It's a sordid, filthy tale, not for the weak. Are you sure you can stomach it? Some secrets are better left uncovered. Don't even try. Seriously. Good choice. The less you think about the jacket, the better. Awful and familiar. It doesn't help. You can still smell it. Don't you recognize it? That idiot's pungency. That faintly cloying sweetness. Only death smells like that. Something cold wakes in the pit of your stomach. Fear. It is death. It must be. The lieutenant has already brought a handkerchief to his nose. There's some tear, an empty cigarette package, and a crumpled kebab wrapper in the trash bin. Two empty bottles of Tallulah vodka and a can of black potent porter is all you find. A tragedy. Whoever tossed it here was a heavy smoker. The brand name reads Red Astra. Red Astra is the black market version of Astra cigarettes, known for their high tar content. You see traces of mayonnaise and ketchup on it, as well as a tomato wedge. The wrapper reads Shish Kebab Revachon. It's no older than a day or two. No mold yet. A man lies on the boardwalk. His limbs bent and neck turned at an unnatural angle. Right next to him is an empty bottle of spirits. In his cramped hand, a chewing gum wrapper. Hold on.
Lividity is faintly pronounced. Whoever this is, he's been dead for two days. No longer. We need to investigate. Calm now. Carefully. Just another day. Just another dead body. Breathe. There's some dried blood on the metal bench, right where the corpse's head rests. The floorboards are rotten and slippery wet around the hole. An empty bottle lies nearby. A chewing gum wrapper is clutched in his fist. A dried chunk of blood covers the hair at the back of his head. An open wound. It's sticky and cold to your touch. This is what killed him. I don't see any other major wounds, do you? Seems like the head wound was fatal. It's exactly the shape of the bench. They screech under your feet ominously. It's hard to say whether the dead man's weight was the cause of the boardwalk to break. It definitely looks fragile. He could have easily disappeared into the sea through that hole, and you would have never found him. A 0.75 liter Tallulah vodka with its cap missing. There's hardly anything left inside. Tear all around us. I'd prefer if you didn't collect them this time. It's not proper. True. It feels disrespectful. Rabowski spearmint chewing gum. Green leaves on the cover. The man's mouth is half agape from the terror of the fall. The blackness of death. Stench. You think you see white chewing gum too? He ate the whole pack, right? It's to cover the smell of alcohol before going home. The worst thing is... I've seen it before. Almost the same scenario. Even the chewing gum. It's always the same. The entire boardwalk creaks in the wind as you take a step back. He's wearing mud caked boots, beige trousers, and an old brown leather jacket with a bright blue lining. There are traces of kebab sauce on his chest. The leather jacket suits him well. It must be custom made. You find some sunflower seeds and a rain-soaked library card folded into two. His jacket feels sodden and heavy under your hand. Good. We should take a look at that library card after this is done. The man has fallen through a crack in the boardwalk and hit his head against the metal bench. Coagulated blood covers his black hair. One of his feet is still dangling through the hole. A bad fall. It might have been dark outside. This place is a minefield in the dark. His expression is dull, like the sea behind him. Drops of water shining on his moustache. His eyes, empty and wide, look frightening in their frozen gaze. Height, 170 to 175 centimeters. Curly hair, stout build, age approximately 50 to 60 years. Looks like one of the locals. He'd have to know this spot to come here. You don't just walk over here. But that's just a lazy assumption. What do you think? This is an omen, a sign from above. Don't start drinking again. Well, at least you're not married. Or, what if you are? But let's try to not run ahead. For now, all we know is that he's an unidentified middle-aged man found dead on the Martinez boardwalk. Death by misadventure. He slipped and fell through the boardwalk. A truly unfortunate accident. If it wouldn't have been for that bench, he'd be alive. Oh yes. Some symptoms of acute alcohol poisoning could have definitely played a role here. Severe confusion, respiratory depression, unpredictable behavior. But I think that death arrived through head trauma, not liver failure. What about it? 
The deceased ate some kebab. It's probably from a nearby place, maybe in the box. Sometimes a kebab is just a kebab. They'll seal this place off after the news reaches the coalition officials. I doubt that they have enough resources to actually repair the bold wall. Not that sealing it off would keep anyone away. All it does is keep the city council's hands clean. No, I don't see anything that points in that direction. For now, let's treat this case as a simple, albeit sad, accident, and related to the murder case. Agreed. If this somehow converges later, why not? But keep it simple for now. It does seem to be a pretty straightforward misadventure, although there's still a question of identifying the body. From where I stand, I can see two options. We either take the case and follow the leads to identify the body on our own, or we report back to the station and leave this for our colleagues to handle. A field autopsy isn't necessary if the cause of death doesn't appear to be criminal, and this looks like a simple accident to me. I'd say we should just write down head trauma in the autopsy report and leave it at that. It would save us at least two hours of unnecessary work. Good call. The guys at processing can take care of the rest. All right, we should first examine the library card you found. Then we can call the station from my kinema. Let them know we are taking the case. The library card is folded into two and still slightly wet to the touch. The front side reads, Central General Public Library Card, issued to Billy Mejean expires July 53. Billy is a unisex name. Could be the deceased or his family member. Whoever owns this card is an avid reader. You find a list of books written in blue pencil. Radio thriller. Stand a little less between me and the sun. The last one in the list is The Glinton Curve by M. Theobald. A library stamp indicates that the book has been returned. Most of these titles seem to be in the sci-fi genre. Some thrillers, too. If lost, please return the card to the library. Dial 005-02-55211 or visit us at Moreau Street, 78, Jamrock. Business hours, 900 to 1800. Good. We should give them a call from my kinema. See if we can learn anything about Billy Mejean. Good idea. There was plenty of information here to go by.
This trap's not too hard to spot. Once you know what to look for, keeping it hidden has not been a priority for the cryptozoologist. The reeds sway in the coastal breeze. They seem to be waiting for something. The wind picks up here, near the cape's end, surrounding the narrow strip of land from three cardinal directions. It's cold for this time of year. Nothing but locusts in this trap as well. Definitely no cryptozoological monstrosity. Empty as all of them. One more of these and we are done. No, no, I'm fine. I didn't mean to complain, it's just... a sand dune in front of it. The door hasn't been opened in a long while. You see a handle. It's military. A service depot of some sort. The washerwoman mentioned a depot at the coast. She said it was for moving ammo and cargo across the bay. This might be it. This is the last of the traps, the one mor the reeds by the abandoned campsite hiss and shake. The later it gets, the colder. Remnants of the camp can still be seen in the sand, the fire that's gone out. You feel strange, somehow. The trap feels light and silent as you pick it up. Something is different here. No locusts. No phasmid either, but still. Well, the bait worked on something. This doesn't mean it was a reed monster, though. Unless you see one in there, I just see an empty trap. Okay, but after that we get back to our own assignments. There is no justification for this detour at this point of our investigation. We have a lot of work to do back in town. The reeds by the abandoned, the later it gets.
Oh, sweetie, I don't even know how to thank you for finding my husband and helping him out. I hope we haven't been too much trouble for you. I knew it. Well, in that case, sweetie, let me give you a small token of my gratitude. It's a tie, mask in origin. The pin is an antique, quite special to the cryptozoological community. The little silvery knob holding the tie together feels warm in your hand. It's in the shape of an avian skull with eight eyes. You could ask her about this when you get the time. It's probably a cryptid, but the phasmid, of course, is more important. Oh, you don't want to hear about some old woman's ramblings. Ramblings? Nonsense. Your description of the phasmid is the most precise I've ever heard. But darling, I didn't even get the size of it right. Measuring things is important. How did she get the size? You were a child, my dear. Really. It's extraordinary what you were able to describe. Now go on. Tell our friend about it. He's proven his interest in the field. Reflexively, the lieutenant read his, his familiar notebook. Well, it was summer. I was building a racing track out of sand on the beach near a tall stand of reeds. Quite a tall one. Many times my height, I remember. When, all of a sudden... Ah, I'm getting ahead of myself. I was five and a half in Betancourt in the suburbs. My grandmother had a summer home there. Betancourt got bombed in the war. It used to be quite near, circa... 20 kilometers from here. The strangest moment of my life. I looked up and one of the reeds moved. Not like a plant, but like a living thing. It stood up and looked at me. Its body unfolded like some antique toy. I've never seen anything like it. I didn't know this can happen, so I reached my arm and touched the thing. It felt just like a stalk of reed, but it moved, swaying, towering above me. After a while, 20 seconds, a minute maybe, it left, went into the reeds. I tried, but I was only a child. There was mud and high water. I couldn't see it anymore. I was just standing there, knee deep in mud, looking around me. Where did you go? Don't go. I ran back home to my grandmother and asked her if reeds could walk and told her they were looking at me. <laughs> of course, she just laughed at me, but I knew what I'd seen. For years, it was a story I told at parties when I wanted to impress boys, that sort of thing. Of course, most people just took it as a strange, amusing anecdote. So did I, honestly. But then I met Morel. We were on a date. Can you imagine? She tells me a story, and it's the most detailed report of the Insulindian phasmid I've ever heard. The sounds. She told me it hissed. It did, yes. Like reeds in a gust of wind. The way it moved, the colour, how some of its limbs were white, like marble. It matched perfectly with what I know from other accounts. It was amazing. If it weren't for Lena, I might have given up hope years ago. It's no exaggeration to say that she restored my faith in my profession. Our first, yes. The glance is tender, yes, but tempered by something else. A thought she can't express, even to him. Interesting. Not all of them. There is some white coloration reported, along with beige, where the camouflage ends. It's hard to say how big things are when you're quite small yourself. To me, it seemed to be taller than I was then, but... That's probably not the case. 
What if it is the case? How could she? Who imagines this? She didn't know about the phasmid. This is the main thing here, what makes it a confirmed sighting. She had no previous knowledge of the insect. So she couldn't have made it up, or imagined it. That's true, yes. I'm almost certain neither my mother nor my grandmother knew of it. It was only when I started telling my story as a teenager that boys would tell me, Lena, you trying to tell us you saw the insulin Indian phasmid out there in those reeds? Get out of here. <laughs> they just give me a cider and ruffle my hair and tell me to stop dreaming. But I saw it. I thought it was a wonderful story, ma'am. You're welcome, sweetie. I do appreciate the chance to relive it whenever I get one. It was just... <sighs> such an impossibly sunshiny day. So warm. I couldn't possibly shower thanks on you as enthusiastically as my wife has, but I am grateful for your assistance, officer. Good. Okay. And? Completely empty? No locusts? No phasmid either? That's not ideal, but... I definitely left that one stocked. Hmm. Right from the campsite? Just means the Insul Indian Phasmid is even more clever than we thought. She's engaging in a well-known self-deception called motivated reasoning. You should correct them. Of course, more clever. Yes, the Phantasma Dea picked off the locusts and escaped. This is good news, though we'll have to reconsider the design of the traps, make them more secure. Another trip to the reeds. I appreciate your concern, officer, but please leave this to the experts. Unless you have an alternative hypothesis you'd like to venture. Actually, no. Excuse me for getting emotional. This is a big deal for us. You've helped us twice now, and brought some great news too. My gratitude, and the gratitude of the Societe Cryptozoologique de Ravishol is yours. Heartfelt gratitude. But does it feel like closure? What really happened? Thank you, it's an honor. We should probably return to our main investigation here. This has been refreshing, but... Damn it, Lieutenant. Have you no intellectual curiosity? Hello. Lena and I were just discussing the design of the new trap. You have your suspicions, 
but nothing you can form into a viable explanation. A different cryptid? Oh, sweetie. Maybe you should stick to human detective work. Uh, no. No, of course not. Why? Well, he's been a little unenthusiastic about the trip. More so than usual. But that's understandable. He just wants to get home and warm up. Inside, you see a set of steering levers, a radio microphone, a pull-out tool. This is Precinct 57. How may I assist you? Hold on, officer. I've got Central Jamrock Public Library on the line, and I've already introduced you to the librarian. Connecting the call in two. One. Yes, this is Central Jamrock Public Library here. How can I help you, officer? Billy. Billy Majon, you said. Give me a moment. I'll have to check our database. Yes, hello. Are you still there? I found Billy Majon's home address. Is that all right? No phone number, unfortunately. They're too poor to have a phone line. Here we go, sir. Rue de saint Gislaine, 33B, apartment number 20. It's in Martinez, I believe. Capeside Apartments, it says. That's all. By the pier, north of here, those big apartment buildings there. It says here that they returned their last book just a few days ago, but I wasn't at work that day. Marie? Marie? Do you remember a reader named Billy Majon? They returned a Tibalt book the other day. Yes, it, it was my colleague Marie. Uh, she said that it was Billy's husband who returned the book. He also asked for this new sci-fi release, Lowe's Radio City 87. But we don't have it yet. Good. You have a name now. Marie knows Billy. She's been working here longer than me. Sometimes her husband returns some books for her. Sorry, no. Marie only knows him by sight. Marie! She said it was an older man, and that she's pretty sure he'd had a drink or two the last time she saw him. Uh... One second. Sorry. Marie wasn't really paying any attention to that. Happy we could help. Goodbye, officer. Anything else you need from me? One moment. Can you please describe the body? Age, sex, cause of death? We suspect he might have been inebriated when he fell. There were bottles all around him and traces of vomit on his shirt. Any signs of violence? No field autopsy necessary. What about his belongings? Did you examine his clothes? Any information on the library card? Good, you have a lead. Do you and Lieutenant Kitsuragi want to take the case or should I assign it to someone else? I have assigned the case to Lieutenant Kim Kitsuragi. Please follow up on this library lead to identify the man. We'll send someone to take the body to the morgue. That's all for now. Thank you for reporting in. Is there anything else I can do for you? 57th, over and out.
In the cabin, you see a set of steering levers, a radio on a hook, a pull-out toolbox, and the soft glow of the fuel preheater gauge. I can't believe this shit. 